Have you guys ever wanted to keep that unique fish or shrimp that you just didn't have the water parameters for, or maybe they were a little bit too difficult? Well, today's video, I'm gonna show you how to create the perfect environment for those difficult fish. What is going on, Shrimp Keepers? This is Rob with FlipAquatics.com, and today we are talking about a very interesting topic, which is well water, tap water, and how you can use RO water or distilled water to make the perfect environment for those difficult fish or shrimp. Today, we're gonna fully dive into this, and I hope you guys are able to learn something. Let's get right into the video. So if you guys are like us, Flip Aquatics, we are located in the city and we have tap water. So tap water is great. We use it for a lot of our fish. We use it for our plants, snails, shrimp, but there are some downsides to using tap water. Tap water can be very inconsistent Depending on the season, there can be a lot of issues with it. For example, if the city is treating for a certain bacterial bloom, they might put chemicals into the water that aren't necessarily bad for me. They might not be bad for your dog, your cat, other animals, but to aquatics, they can be absolutely terrible. They can wipe out a whole fish tank. They can wipe out a whole system. I personally have had a friend that was using tap water. Something happened, the city dosed for something, and it completely wiped out his whole system. So I'm gonna show you what we use to make our tap water safe so that you can get an idea of the type of investment it takes to make sure that your tap water is good to go for your aquarium. So we take a ton of precautions to make sure our tap water is safe. And so the first thing we do is we use a sediment filter. Now this is just gonna take some of the bigger things out of the water, kind of clean up your water. And we just put it in there as a preventative to take out as much organics as it can. And then once it moves from the sediment filter, it goes to our first carbon tank. Now this is a, I wanna say like a 20 gallon drop. I'm really not 100% sure, so don't quote me on that. But it is a larger container and it holds a lot of carbon. And one thing super unique about our tap water, which you guys might have this too, it has chloramine in it. Which chloramine is chlorine plus ammonia formed together to create chloramine. So our first carbon tower is set up to take out the chlorine out of the system. But by removing the chlorine, it leaves the ammonia, which if you guys have been in fish keeping for long, you'll know ammonia is extremely toxic to all invertebrates, all fish, all aquatic life for the most part. There might be a few exceptions there. So our second carbon tower, which is the same size, it has a much more expensive type of carbon in there, and that is set up to remove the ammonia. So we have to remove the chlorine, the ammonia, and also put a sediment filter on there to make sure the water is good. So we take a lot of precautions to make sure our water is safe, and sometimes things do slip through. So tap water, there are some things that slip through. For example, right now we are dealing with a pH issue, which whatever our city is treating our water with currently is causing the pH to fall super low. Even though it has KH in the water, which is carbonate hardness, which we'll get to in a little bit, our pH likes to crash. So it'll drop down to three, two, one, and then we just have a huge dot up. Now, I don't know if it ever dropped to one, but just as an example, it is dropping extremely low. So we're having to add crushed coral, things to the tank to stabilize that. But that is something that if you are not used to checking your tap water, things can really happen quick. But I did want to address well water because those of you that have well water, I used to be one of you. I still have well water at my house. You think that, okay, my water is perfect. It isn't gonna change, it's well water. It comes from the same well. Well, in my neck of the woods, there's farming that happens. There's other things that are happening in the environment, different rainfall levels. If there's a farmer down the street, they might spray their field with pesticide that again, isn't harmful to you or me or our pets, but could be catastrophic to your invertebrates and your other aquatic life. So for that reason, well water can also be extremely inconsistent depending on the season. And that's not even talking about most people have softeners. Softeners are adding salt to your water to soften the water to let your pipes last longer, be better on your fixtures. But that softened water can actually be harmful to your invertebrates, to your plants, to your fish, especially your plants. Plants will actually absorb that salt through the roots and end up suffocating themselves. I had this problem when I was doing fish keeping at home. I had a ton of plants and they all kept dying after a couple months. I couldn't figure out what was going on. So softeners can be bad. So again, there's a lot of inconsistencies with well water. So that's why I'm really gonna push for RO water or distilled water is gonna be the best bet for you. So let's jump into our kind of RO system that we have here. And then we'll talk more about what RO means for you and how you can use it in your aquarium. 
Before we get into RO water, I wanna first talk about testing. So we test a lot of water here because we're using a lot of tap water, so we always have to be on top of our parameters. Here are all the things that we test for and that I would suggest you having at home, especially if you wanna use tap water or well water, even RO water, because these all can come in handy. First thing, GH, then we got cage. We have our ammonia alerts. We have our five in one test strips. We have a TDS pen. This is TDS easy. We have a pH meter. And then lastly, we have shrimp prep, which is not a testing solution, but it's something really good to have around. So let's first start with GH. GH is probably one of the most important things. It stands for general hardness. This is how hard your water is. Now this isn't gonna influence your pH or anything like that. This is just general hardness. Now all livestock like GH. GH is good for almost every invertebrate, every fish, every plant, everything. It's calcium. And so for us, Neocaridina, we try to keep at about a 10 GH, and then Caridina, usually about five. Our fish, depending on what they are, anywhere between three to 15. And so it's a really good test kit to have around. And all you do to test is just put the drops in, and then whenever the solution changes colors, that's how many degrees of hardness you have. So if it took 10 drops to change it, you have 10 GH. Now KH is basically pH. And that doesn't mean it is pH, but KH is what dictates your pH. So the more KH you have, the harder it is to influence your pH, the harder it is to get a low pH. So for example, if you have 10 KH, your pH is gonna be above seven, almost 99% of the time. That's just how it works. So for us, a really good rule to follow is for every two GH you have, you need one cage. It's a good ratio, two to one. So Neocaridina, if we have 10 GH, we want five cage. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be four, it can be six. Another really important thing to point out here, if you're using live bacteria like Fritz Turbo Start, you're gonna have to have cage in your water or else the turbo starts gonna die, the live bacteria is gonna die because a lot of life forms, including live bacteria, use cage as a building block to really get their start, to fuel their growth. Now next up, we have ammonia alerts. Now these are just the test strips. I don't recommend these for actually telling how much ammonia is in the water, but I do recommend them for telling whether you have ammonia in your water or not. If it changes colors, obviously you have ammonia and that's where you actually get out the test solution, test to see how much ammonia you have, whether you need to dose with live bacteria, your cycle's dead, it can really tell you a lot of parameters. Next up is the five in one test strip. This is also gonna tell you GH, KH, I believe it tells you nitrate, nitrate, and then pH. And we use this to tell us if the cycle's working or not. It also gives us an idea of what the GH is, what the KH is. These two first ones are much better at that, but the five in one is definitely gonna give you an indicator for your cycle. So it's gonna tell you what your nitrate is, what your nitrate is, and basically what all that means is ammonia is the first part of the cycle. So in every aquarium, fish poop, fish food decays, things go wrong, and what's gonna happen is all that stuff is gonna cause ammonia. A certain bacteria forms, that converts ammonia to nitrite, and then converts it to nitrate. So ammonia is toxic, nitrate's toxic, and nitrate is toxic only in really high numbers. So that's just a real quick overview of the cycling process. Again, really good to have around because it's gonna tell you what's going on with your water. If your tap water, well water have nitrates in them, have ammonia in them, you can make a lot of decisions based on that. Next up is TDS. This is really important when remineralizing, so we'll really talk about this in the next video. Uh, next up is a pH pen, which you don't have to have a pH pen. It is useful when you have a lot of aquariums like we do, but if you're just at home and you only have a few aquariums, the API Master Test Kit comes with pH test kit. And one thing that we get questioned a lot on, if you test with the low range pH and it reads the top of the low range, which would be 7.6, that means you have to test the high range. Same thing with the high range. The low point, I believe, is 7.6. So if you test high range pH and it reads 7.6, that means you have to test low range to get the accurate reading. So really important to know for all of you at home. Lastly is shrimp prep. This is a great product. We also use Fritz ACCR. This is how we neutralize ammonia and chlorine. So if you have chloramine in your tap water, this will neutralize both the ammonia and the chlorine. Ammonia will still read even after it's neutralized and live bacteria can still absorb ammonia 
after it's neutralized by shrimp prep or ACCR. Now, if you're using something like Seachem Prime or Fritz Complete, those are much more concentrated dechlorinators. They will get rid of the ammonia too. They will get rid of the chlorine. But one thing they will do, if you don't have good oxygen exchange, they will suffocate your fish, your shrimp, your snails. So that's why we use something that's a little less concentrated. So there's a lot more room for air. So now that you guys understand what GH is, KH is, TDS, and even pH, now we can really talk about what is RO water. So RO water stands for reverse osmosis. A lot of people call it RODI water, which stands for reverse osmosis deionization. And another water that is very similar to this is distilled water. So what those all have in common is they have a zero TDS, they have no GH, no KH. You're basically starting with nothing. It's just liquid. It has nothing in it. Now, if I can equate that to anything, if I was an artist, the last thing I wanna do is start working on someone else's piece of art that's unfinished. I wanna start with a blank canvas that I can make exactly how I envision it. And that's what RO water is. It's a blank canvas. It's ready for you to turn it into whatever you need it for, for the type of animal that you wanna keep. So if you wanna keep Neocaridina, if you wanna keep Caridina shrimp, if you wanna keep Rip uh, cichlids, if you wanna keep you know, some soft water tetra, if you have RO water, you can build the perfect environment for that fish and make sure it's the best water that can lead to the best success, best breeding that you can possibly have. So I always equate water to foundation of a building. It is the building block of all aquariums and it is the starting place. If you have the right water, you are off to the most successful start that you can, you can do. And I always say this, the most expensive fish is a dead fish. The most expensive shrimp is a dead shrimp. So why not start with the best option that you can for water and then go from there? So two of the biggest complaints I hear when talking about RO water is one, it's too expensive and two, it's too difficult. So too expensive, we just addressed this. What's the most expensive type of fish? It's a dead fish. So having the right aquarium is always gonna set you up for success. Now, too difficult, I'm gonna show you exactly how we set up RO system behind me and show you how you can do it yourself, and it's much easier than you think. Okay, so RO systems are really not that difficult. They're actually pretty simple. So let me walk you through our system. Now our system is a little complex, but we'll get into it. I'll make it as simple as possible. First step of an RO system is gonna be a sediment filter. So this is just, again, a filter that's just gonna catch debris. It's gonna make sure nothing gets into your, your RO system that could clog it up, your DI resin. So like, this is basically the step-by-step. -step. Again, I'm gonna try and make this as simple as possible. Let's just dive into it. We have our sediment filter. From our sediment filter, we go to a booster pump. A booster pump, all it's, all it's doing is basically increasing the pressure. We wanna put as much pressure through our RO membrane as humanly possible because that's how we're gonna get the maximum amount of yield of RO water to wastewater. Now we'll talk about that in a second. So we go up into a booster pump. We actually run ours at 120 PSIs, which I, I wanna say a normal house is like 60 PSI. So we're really pumping some pressure on it. If you're running this at home, you don't need a booster pump. It's just an add-on thing if you're producing a lot of RO water. From the pressure pump, we go into our sediment filters, which these ones actually aren't sediment filters. The first one, I lied, the first one is a sediment filter. It's actually a much more fine sediment filter, so it's gonna get even smaller particles. The one after that, we actually have two carbon filters, which are, again, just in there to make the water as clean as possible before it actually gets to our RO membrane. So at the very top is the next step. This is our RO membrane. Now this thing is literally just a ton of fibers pressed together, super, super small, so that it's forcing water through there to basically take any impurity out that it possibly can, strip it of any hardness, anything like that. So what's gonna happen is for every gallon, or let's say for every 10 gallons of water you put through an RO system, you actually are only gonna get maybe at best case, five gallons of good water. So you're gonna have five gallons of good water that is zero TDS and five gallons of wastewater, which is you know 100 TDS, 200 TDS, 400 TDS, 1000 TDS, whatever it is. So that's what's happening with the RO filter. Now you could stop there and you would be good, but if you wanna go the extra step, over here we have DI resin. So we have two of these filters. Now this is again, just to clean the water that one more step. When you're, when you're working with the amount of volume that we have as far as shrimp, fish, um, snails, plants, like you wanna have the perfect water 
as a great building block for success. So when we are using RO water, we wanna make sure it's as clean as possible. So the last step is the DI resin. From there, it's actually gonna go over to our storage tubs. They're 275 gallons each. We store, I don't know, 275 by six. That's how many gallons we store this. We have, a, we have over 1,200 gallons of RO water at any given time. And so literally all we do is we just turn on a little valve here and RO water will start flowing. I'm not gonna do it because it's pretty loud. The pump will kick on. And then from there, we have it in all of our totes. Now, Frank, I wouldn't look at that tote. That tank's, that tote's a little dirty. We use that one upstairs. It hasn't been changed in a while, so ignore that one. But all the other ones we do use, so we use five of the six normally. Um, but these totes, again, hold a lot of RO water. And then we actually do a lot of remineralization in these totes too, which we'll talk about that in a future video. But for now, just understand that RO water, you can store it like this. It's good to put a bubbler in there. So like something to keep the oxygen going and that will keep your pH around seven. It will also keep your RO water from going stagnant and being gross and slime building up in them from the dust that falls. And so it's always good to have an air stone in there. We use our RO water pretty regularly. So we don't use an air stone, but as Frank was showing you, this one pond that we don't use, uh, it gets a little gross. Like you can see, Frank, you might as well just show them now. We got like in this corner, there's some nasty gunk. And really what all that's from is from dust from the air. Anyway, in a future video, we're actually gonna release later this week, we're gonna talk about remineralizing RO water for your aquarium, how that looks like, what we do here, and how you can be successful. But this shows you our RO system, our RO storage, our recommendations for keeping RO water, and then we'll get into more of this in the next video. So if you guys are looking to keep those difficult shrimp, or not even, I wouldn't even say difficult, if you're looking to keep those shrimp that require certain parameters and your parameters at home don't match those, RO water, I'm telling you, or distilled water is the solution for you. So in next video, we're gonna talk about how to remineralize your water and give you all the tips and tricks on how we're so successful here at Flip Aquatics so that hopefully you can replicate that at home. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, God bless, and we'll catch you on the flip side.